Hi everyone and welcome to our first Cling Spore Fit show of 2022. We've, we're glad that you've joined us today and we have an exciting show for you. Some great information as always. And we want to invite you to like and share the video and we want you to comment uh, with questions or uh, general comments, but we have a little game we want you to play with us today. If you will comment your name and the number of ingredients in Paja's recipe that will be later on in the show, your name will go in a drawing for a $100 gift certificate to your favorite grocery store. So if your name is drawn, we'll get in touch with you to see which one that is. But first, let's get an update about COVID from Jennifer Eichard. Thank you, Lori. Hi, I'm Jennifer Eichard, and you probably know me from the Human Resources Department. I'm here today to talk about um, the COVID-19 and the Omicron variant that is going on, uh, kind of running rampant in our area. Um, oh, and I also wanted to mention too that Tammy is uh, not able to be with us today, so that's why I'm filling in. Uh, she's very disappointed that she's not able to do this tonight, and she is definitely going to miss y'all. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that um, we're going to start with Catawba County. Uh, there are 1,132 new cases. There are 30,890 cases in Catawba County with 110 hospitalizations. Um, just to give you an idea of what has happened in our county over the past seven days. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about um, the cases that are in North Carolina. There are 18,452 newly reported cases and there are 4,896 people that are hospitalized currently. Um, they also want to note too that as you can see there that there are 74% of the adult population is at least vaccinated with one dose and there's 70% of adults vaccinated with either the two doses or the one dose of the Johnson & Johnson shot. The Omicron is trending again, as you can see with the uh, United States. Over the past uh, seven days, it has increased to 69,272 cases. Uh, of course, that is all across the United States, but that is still a very high number. Uh, so it is trending up again. And then lastly, uh, the level of the transition, if you'll look at the map, it's all red. Um, I know in previous weeks we've had that um, some of them were at least in the substantial or maybe even in the moderate range, which was a nice um, addition, I guess, in knowing that we were probably on a trend to not have as many cases. But as you can see now, it is a little on the scary side just to know that we are trending in high transmission all across the United States with that full red color. So. Uh, again, you know, you just have to be safe and social distance and uh, just try to wear your mask at all times whenever you're around other people. And that is all I have to report. Um, last, uh, now we will show a video called Best and the Best and Worst Face Mask for COVID-19 Prevention. Thank you. As a medical doctor, uh, it's in my opinion that the data exists to show that the masks, masking is one of the most important things that we can do. And it absolutely curves the spread of COVID. And that's an important thing because I've had a chance to study COVID and I know more than anyone else um, uh, because I'm a researcher, just how important prevention is. It's just like cancer, heart disease, diabetes, anything else. We wanna avoid this if we can. And so for right now, Masking is, to me, a second nature thing that we got to do. It's kind of like brushing your teeth before you go to bed at night or when you get in a car, putting on your seatbelt or stopping at the stop line is just simply one of those things that keeps everyone safe. These are the comparison of blood vessels in the lung. Now, on the left, you can actually see 
what a healthy lung looks like. There's blood vessels that are there and they're beautiful lacy blood vessels and they're wrapped around an air pocket. And on the right, you can actually see is after COVID-19. This is a respiratory virus that's infected the lung. And you can see how it completely changes the lung. It's not a very pretty picture. Now, I do want to emphasize that these changes are um, uh, in the lungs of people who had severe COVID and died. And even though we looked at every patient and we found this in every patient we examined, it's really too early to say for sure that everyone who gets a coronavirus is going to suffer from these changes. But this is actually part of what we're learning. This is something you definitely, we all definitely want to avoid. Now we're going to talk about masks since we know that we still unfortunately need to be wearing them. And yes, everybody's sick of it, of course. This is actually a study from Duke University. So one of the great mm -hmm. universities of our country. And they published a study taking a look at which masks were most effective to protect us. And surprisingly, they also took a look at which masks actually don't really work at all. So what I want to do is to walk you guys through, you know, three masks that um, uh, work and two that don't work really well. The, this study actually looked at the fitted N95, which is what healthcare workers mm -hmm. actually have. And in the beginning, this is what we all heard about is the N95. And it's not surprising that that's one of the best because that's what healthcare workers use in the hospital to say safe. It gives them their badges of honor on their faces. That's yeah. right. You got to have right. it fitted. It actually seals around the face. But here's the deal you don't really need to freak out about trying to find one of these things because they're still being reserved and saved for our healthcare workers. The right. KN95 is actually more available. They're not exactly the same. They're, they're pretty good. But in the study, you know, um, the next best uh, mask to the KN, uh, the KN95s, uh, KN95s and N95s actually are the procedure masks. Now, these are pretty easy to get. Um, and the important thing about these is they're also um, surgical masks. Uh, they're what your dental hygienists wear, so you can, they're comfortable, you can wear them all day, and surgeons will wear them for hours. I'll give you a little orientation. There's a top and a bottom, and the top actually has this wire, um, wire uh, bridge. Right. When you wear it, bend it around your nose, just like this. This is how you fit it, you put it on your ear, get a really good shit. Pull so right, it down over your chin. Pull yeah. it down over your chin, okay? Really comfortable to wear. And the thing is that we've got the data that this actually works. You know, it's pretty good. It's the next best thing to an N95. And the key thing is that these are easy to get. They are single use only. So when you're done with them, you just toss them out. This research from Duke University actually showed that poly cotton masks, like the one you have, um, are equally effective as the procedure or surgical masks, as long as they have two or three layers. Now, three layers are better than two. And I have one right here. You can mm -hmm. see there's a front layer with blue and there's a white layer in back. There's another one on the in inside. Two layers is just fine. You don't need to add a filter. They're really comfortable, they're convenient, and they're washable. So I want to show you two masks that kind of flunk the test is what I would call it. And one of them is something that we've all seen, and that is the bandana, right? We've seen people walking mm -hmm. around with these, right? And what they actually found is that um, uh, wearing a bandana is definitely better than not wearing a mask, but it's only a little bit better than nothing at all. So not that great. So when I see somebody wearing a bandana, like I sort of step away. It's just not a good one. But there's a worse one. And the worse one, actually, surprisingly, is this. We've seen these before, the neck gaiter. Is it worse than wearing nothing? You know, it's hard to believe, but that's actually what they found in this uh, published study. And the explanation is that the shape of the gaiter allows respiratory droplets to actually um, become finer. And then the shape of the gator allows these droplets, the finer droplets to spray out in the air, which is worse than not wearing a mask at all. And can I just leave your viewers with three things? Um, one, it's so simple, wear a mask, it's gonna protect you and protect other people. Number two, keep a safe distance. And number three, wash your hands. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, that's some kind of dismal news, but the uh, video about the mask uh, and what kind of wear and how to wear them is helpful because uh, we all need a refresher course in that. I think as time passes, we get a little bit lazy and wear our mask below our nose, which is a no-no, a nose-no. <laughs> um, and this makes me think about years ago when I used to teach horseback riding lessons and you have a child who is very interested and you know they're going to take lessons for a while and you have to have that conversation with their parents 
where you say it's really not a matter of if your child is going to fall off the horse, it's a matter of when. So I think that that may be the case with COVID. So we all need to do what we can to stay as healthy as possible and to do what we can to prevent that, just like the child wants to do what it can to prevent a fall. So let's just all try to stay healthy and um, look forward to brighter days. So the next thing that we have on board for you is Dr. George Place, and he's going to talk to us about anti-resolution resolutions. George? Well, hello everyone. Uh, I'm George Place, and I'm here to give you a talk about uh, New Year's resolutions, but actually the title is the anti-resolution when you're considering your New Year health resolution. So let me, uh, let me dive into that a little bit. Uh, you probably are aware that the vast majority of folks make all kinds of promises in, to themselves about things that they wanna do. It's almost always around increasing activity, maybe improving diet, ultimately trying to lose weight. And unfortunately, the vast majority of folks by February are no longer actively engaged in their New Year's resolution. And so the reason that we called this talk the anti-resolution is that I wanna encourage you to quit calling it a resolution. I'm all about making change, but I encourage you to reset your mind and start thinking that if you want to actually make a change in your health, we're gonna consider it a lifestyle change. I think that one of the challenges is resolution almost seems like, well, we're gonna give it a shot and it really doesn't sound like a commitment, right? Just like if I say I'm on a new diet, that doesn't sound like I've really changed my lifestyle. And I will say, by the way, for folks that are starting a new diet, Really, one of the best things I can recommend to you is don't do diets. In fact, I heard a, a, a nutrition expert saying, do you think it's a coincidence that the word die is in diets? Thought that was uh, something to remember. If you're making a change in how you consume food, you need to be thinking about it as a lifestyle change. If you can't keep up that change for the rest of your life, you really don't wanna start engaging in the activity because then you start going on this yo-yo effect. And so likewise, I'm afraid that for folks that start resolutions and, and bail on them after a month continually, there may be actually some brain training going on that change isn't possible. And I'm here to tell you that's absolutely not true. You definitely can make changes. And so this is what this talk is about. I wanna show you some of the science behind behavior change, and it's really quite simple. So take a look at this. Uh, you can find online all the different reasons why uh, psychologists will say that we fail in resolutions. And you can see here's six major ones. Uh, the resolution is unrealistic. There's not accountability. Maybe there's no tracking or review. Uh, there's a lack of planning, self-doubt. The why is unclear. And you hear all those reasons and you think, man, there's a whole lot working against me, right? Well, let's simplify these six reasons into just three simple little categories. Notice how each of these categories is about one of three things. It's about ability. In other words, what the change that you hope to make was just too difficult. Or motivation meaning that the change you wanted to make, you really weren't that motivated to make. And then prompt, in other words, that thing that triggers you to behavior. I want to show you how those three things are related to making very sustainable behavior change. And once you're kind of aware of these three things, ability, motivation, and prompt, you can really back up and consider, okay, I want to make a behavior change. How can I quite frankly, manipulate these three qualities in the change that I desire. So let me give you some examples. We're not gonna think about making resolutions. We're gonna think about actually creating habits. We're gonna think about creating behavior change that is enduring. And so the way that you get off that road of same and get on change, 
there's a really excellent model. This is called the Fogg's behavior model. And uh, just remember B equals MAP. In other words, behavior change equals motivation, ability, and the prompt. So let me orient you to this model. So on the y-axis here, we have motivation. And don't worry, I'm not gonna get too mathematical here. But you see motivation, and I want you to think that at the high end of that bar is high motivation, and low is at the bottom of that bar, okay? On the x-axis, we have ability. Now this can be confusing, but on the far end is easy to do, and as we get closer, we've got hard to do, and then we're gonna put an action line right in that model. So when your prompt is above the action line, it's very likely that your behavior change will succeed. If your prompt is below the action line, it's not likely that you will be able to make the behavior change. All right, let me give you some examples to clear all this up so that it's not confusing. Let's say that you made a New Year's resolution, you want to get exercise, you want to get more active. And maybe you, you thought, well, uh, I'm going to start walking, which is one of the number one things I recommend to folks to think about, right? Walking is a, is, a, is a pretty easy activity. We all do it, no special abilities. You can do it anywhere. But let's be honest. Perhaps your motivation is pretty low. And when you think about walking, if my motivation is low, as long as I set a very easy goal, I get it, hot, I get it far on the end of that x-axis, it's very easy to do, you can see where those two lines cross. My motivation is low, but I made it really easy, and the intersection of those two levels are above the action line, right? So if motivation is low, easy might be, you know, five minutes a day. Right now, let's say I don't walk at all. Make it a very easy, achievable goal. I start at five minutes a day. That's very easy to do, but we're lacking one thing, right? Remember. Behavior change equals MAP. We've got the motivation. I mean, it's not very high, but the ability matches up. It's very easy to do, but where's our prompt? So the prompt could be something like, hey, I'm gonna put shoes by the door or by the coffee maker. And so when I get up in the morning and I see those shoes, I'm gonna remember, oh yeah, I promised I'm gonna walk for five minutes. Hey, while my coffee's brewing, I'm just gonna walk around the kitchen even. Or maybe my dog needs to go for a walk. So, hey, while my, while my coffee's brewing or maybe right after and I've got my cup of coffee, I'm going to give a five-minute stroll with my dog Dash and um, I set out his leash again as a prompt. Or maybe Dash gets so used to it, he's my prompt. He starts barking if I don't give him a walk, which is actually the case with my dog. So, there you can see an example of how those three things, those three things come to better, to, to, together. We accept the fact that my motivation is low. So I make it very, very easy to do, which puts it above the action line, and then I put a trigger. Something has to remind me. Maybe I tell my wife, hey, every day will you remind me I need to do that five minute walk? I'll show you some examples at the end of other prompts that you can use. But let's say, for example, that and you can see, there you go, it succeeds. So let's say, just like we talked about before, motivation is low, but uh, I'm an overambitious guy. My doctor told me I really need to be walking at least 30 minutes a day. I'm trying to lose 30 pounds. So I say to myself, I'm gonna walk an hour a day. So I've got low motivation, but now I made something really difficult, right? It's a lot more difficult. Maybe the actual walking for an hour isn't so challenging, but the time is challenging. You know, we, we all run short on time. And so, or maybe it's too cold outside to do that. There could be a number of factors that, that really make it harder to do. But you can clearly see from this example on the graph, if motivation is low and it's hard to do, look where those intersect. They're below the action line. So even if you set those shoes by the coffee machine or your dog is barking at you, if you've made the goal too hard, it's below the action line, you're not gonna do it. And then what you're left with is thinking, I'm, I'm a failure, I can't do anything, I can't change my behavior, I guess I might as well just accept the fact that I can't get healthy. 
And that's unfortunately what happens with the whole idea of a failed New Year's resolution. And so I want to I want to convince you that that is not the case. You can absolutely change behavior. I'm going to give you a number of different ways that you can think about it. Prompts are going to fail if you're below that action line. So let's think about how can we affect these factors. First, let's talk about motivation. Sometimes there's ways that you can affect your motivation. For example, you want to walk more. I'm a big coffee drinker. Coffee is bliss for me in the morning. So if I've got a goal of walking in the morning, why not link it to other things that I enjoy like coffee? Or you can see in the slide, she's listening to something on the headphones. I love to listen to podcasts. I love to listen to audiobooks. That's pleasure time for me. So all of a sudden I'm sipping on something I love. I'm listening to something I love. Walking is this very pleasurable activity now and my motivation to do it is much higher. That's me time. It's not work. Or maybe your motivation is totally different. You want to just be active with your kids or your grandkids. That's a time for you to bond. I mean, that's what life has been all about, right? Family. And now is the time where you can really enjoy that by being out and being active with them. Because you know what happens if you sit in the house, they're probably going to do a lot of this. You're probably going to sit on the couch. When you're out doing things, the bonding is really so much more. Maybe it's about stress reduction for you. Walking out in nature, we know reduces stress. Or maybe it's just social connection, right? Tying in what you want to do with other factors that bring you joy is much more likely to boost your motivation. You know, another thing that can boost motivation, I'm not a big fan of it, but it does work for some folks. You know you have this upcoming event. You know, the classic one is, uh, I'm getting married. I want to look good. I want to look good in my clothes. So I'm going to be active so that, you know, I look my best and I feel my best. So a hope can be one. And, you know, quite frankly, fear can also be one for us. Fear is like fire. It can cook for us. It can drive motors and engines. It can do all kinds of great things. It can warm our house, but it can also burn our house down. Clearly, you don't want fear to run away with you, right? But a little bit of fear sometimes can be a great nudge. If you look at older folks that you know that are on dialysis, if you see people that have to take 15 pills a day, you might start thinking, I need to do better, right? I don't want to wait until I'm eating all those pills and spending all my money on health care to decide that I need to make a health change. So, you know, a little bit of that can, can be a motivator as well. You know, I'll tell you another huge bonding, um, uh, or a huge motivator is bonding over what you want to do. So you want to get more active? Is there a way to incorporate social cohesion in your activity? So, for example, I love to work out at a martial arts studio. And when I go and study jujitsu, I've got a great group of people that I'm also training with. And I love the camaraderie as much, if not even more, than the training I get from it. That's a huge piece of why I like to go. And quite frankly, once you have that bonding, you get the accountability, right? If you're not there, they wonder, where are you? And so build social cohesion into your activity. It can just be as much as getting a workout partner. Um, or doing it with your spouse or your loved ones. Okay, so we talked about motivation, but I'll tell you the real secret. Positive psychologists will talk about, yes, motivation is important, but probably the, the easier factor to manipulate here is your ability. And so let me show you all the different ways that you can change ability. First of all, we have to quit thinking that exercise has to happen at this special place in a gym. I love to go to the gym, maybe some of you do too, but it doesn't have to happen there. You don't need to do exercise there. Nor does exercise have to happen for this huge chunk of time in your day. You don't need to put on fancy special clothes to do it. None of that. You could do five minutes of exercise in front of your desk or on your break. Maybe you like to change your shoes if you're gonna go for a walk. Sometimes being more active is simply a choice of taking the stairs instead of the elevator, or every time you go to the store, you park far away. Simple little things, right? And you're much more likely to do it. You're making that ability factor easy to do and taking it away from hard to do. Don't make it complicated or you're just not gonna do it. Maybe you build up to 
maybe doing it more for more time. But if you're at zero, don't jump to an hour. Go from zero to five minutes and let that become part of your life before you start to shift it to a more difficult goal. You know, the other thing too is, uh, is your new habit going to be affordable? If, if this is a brand new change for you and, and it's a very expensive thing to do, that cost might slowly wear you down. So I encourage you to think about how can you make it really cheap. I love yoga, but there's some yoga studios that for you might be a little bit expensive. I know to join a yoga studio sometimes can cost $1,000 a year. If you're going to go to three classes a week, it's worth it. If you're going to go to one class every two weeks, mm, that might not be the right route for you. There's so many other yoga classes you can do online for free, build up a routine, and then maybe think about the studio down the line, just as an example. The other thing, choose an activity, if activity is what you're wanting to make the change in, choose it that's something that is appropriate for you, right? If you're not a runner, don't think to yourself that you're going to go join a CrossFit group and, and start doing wild, crazy exercise, right? Maybe you want to start slow with some joint mobility. Or if you know that that's too slow and boring for you, you need something fast-paced, well, then go for that. But really, try to think about what is going to fit with how you know you are, not who you wish you were. And more importantly, you know, nobody thinks about brushing their teeth, right? This is just, th that's just a daily routine. And so whatever this changes, you want to think about how can you make it a part of your daily routine? Because nobody ever says, well, I ran out of time, so I didn't brush my teeth. Of course you brush. Nobody says, oh, I ran out of time. I don't shower anymore. I, I, I can't, I can't clean up after myself anymore. Um, nobody does that. So Make it part of your routine. And again, we're moving the dial on it to be easier in your ability, making it much more likely that the behavior change will become real lifestyle change. All right. And of course, finally, so we've talked about motivation. We've talked about ability. We've got the prompts, right? What are those little prompts that get us to succeed? We know they have to happen above the action line. So the motivation and the ability have to be there. Let me give you some examples of a few prompts. So first of all, if you're thinking about working out at home, maybe you're a type A uh, super planner type of person. Well, there's all kinds of apps that can help you plan your workout. This is also what training professionals do for you. They give you a plan. You've got something that you're building up towards. I'll tell you the other thing, sometimes just organizing. If you're planning on doing a little bit of extra fitness at work or wherever, lay out your stuff so that you, when you wake up the next morning, you're ready to go. So the organization factor can really be a nice prompt for you. I like to just put things out. If I need to remember to take something with me when I get in the vehicle, I set it by the door, right? So if I set shoes by the door, oh yeah, that's right. I'm gonna walk today for five minutes. Or if I'm planning on walking at work, I'm gonna throw my shoes or maybe a water bottle in a bag and put it in my vehicle. It's ready to go. Maybe I set an alarm. Maybe I, I know that I'm going to do this on my lunch break at 1230, but sometimes I just get so busy I forget. My alarm goes off. That alarm is for me. It's my prompt. Maybe it's post-it note. Whatever it is, all these, all these things are those triggers that can happen uh, as long as you're above that action line, right? I'll tell you some of the strongest prompts are accountability. Get a friend, get a partner. And this last thing in the upper uh, left-hand corner, a trainer. Having a trainer, if you're new, can be a great value. Not only for the accountability, but that's huge, but also helping you to do it the right way. Getting you on the right track so that if you are doing activity, you're doing it in a way that's sustainable. You're doing it in a way that supports proper alignment of your skeleton and uh, focuses on areas that are going to protect your joints. So having a right trainer really does make a difference. And I say all that because I want to make a pitch to you. So here at Klingspore, I have received support from leadership to provide training for, uh, for anybody here that works here. And uh, this is something that the company is offering to you. 
And so I encourage you, utilize this. You know, a lot of times at a facility, a trainer can be a little bit of an expense. But now through your work, that is being offered. And the first thing I would say is I would love to meet with you and do a little one-on-one -on -one discussion about where you're at so that I can know how best to serve you. And again, as a reminder, uh, if you've met me, hopefully you have this, this feeling. I'm not one to judge you, right? What my goal here is I want to help you. Wherever you're at, I want to help you get a little bit healthier, whatever the right way is for you. And so uh, starting out with just an initial interview, we can both learn that together and I can help you set a goal that's going to be most appropriate for you. The other thing, I anticipate setbacks. And so when I have folks I'm working with that they have a setback, you're not going to feel judgment or scolding from me. I'm just going to work with you to get you back on track. It's normal. It's part of the process. So, you know, I know that right now we've got a viewership of this program that's a little bit uh, low. We have a great hope to get that up. So this is my call to action for, for all of our viewers that may be sitting right now watching this and they're like, what, me? Yes, I'm talking to you. Give me a call. Let's put all of what we're learning in here into action. It's great to see it, but let's do some of these things. I encourage you, reach out to me. And you know what? The other thing is don't feel like, boy, if I start working with him, I have to work with him forever. Not at all. You know, we can only do an interview just to set you on a goal, and then I can check in with you from time to time. So again, don't feel like you're going to be locked into something or you would hurt my feelings if you don't want a longer term relationship with a trainer. Just even one meeting or four meetings can get you on the right track for being healthier. I'm eager to do that for you. Uh, you just have to call me or email me, reach out to me, but that's being supported now by your workplace. So use it. Don't waste that resource. And uh, thank you all for tuning in. I uh, really enjoy doing these talks and I hope they're beneficial. If you've got questions, send them my way. I'm eager to help you and thanks again for your attention. Thank you, George. Just remember, be resolute about your resolutions. So next we have Paja and she is going to prepare vegan butternut squash soup. That's a little bit of a tongue twister. And remember, as you're watching, keep track of the number of ingredients that she uses and post that number in the comments. And we'll collect those comments on Friday. That'll be this Friday, January 28th. And those people who posted, we will put your name in a hat for a $100 gift card drawing to your favorite grocery store. So if your identity on YouTube is not clear with your name, just post your name along with that. So here's Paja. Hi, welcome back to Cooking with Paja. Today we're going to make a vegan butternut squash soup. So what we're gonna start off with is some chopped onions here, as I have. We're just gonna put, the, in, put it into a um, mixing bowl. Now along with the chopped onions, you'll want to do some chopped garlic cloves. Um, three should work. Three should be good enough. So we'll put that in there. And then we're also going to do about like two inches of ginger sliced like so. We're going to toss that in there as well. Um, also, we're going to add some chopped cilantro. So I just pretty much used the stems of the cilantro and chopped it up like this. Doesn't have to be perfect, just toss it right in there as well. And we are, we're also gonna add some red, crushed red pepper flakes, some crushed red pepper flakes in here. All right, so now we have our onion mixture. Um, I've already chopped up the butternut squash, as you can see. Try to chop them up in like one inch sizes. Um, you want the sizes to be pretty even so they can cook evenly while 
whenever you're ready to cook them. So what I'm gonna do is gonna turn this on here. We're gonna turn it on to medium. All right, so I've turned this little pot here. Um, it's cooking on a medium temperature. I'm gonna add some extra virgin olive oil. This is organic. So we'll put some of that in here. All right, we're gonna add this little onion mixture into the saucepan. You don't have to use one as big as this, but this is just what I had on hand. Just go ahead and toss everything in there. And pretty much just go ahead and stir this up. And then when your onion turns that translucent or turns translucent, that's when you can add your squash. So we'll just wait for a few minutes until that's it's time to do so. So, I've been cooking my onion mixture for quite some time now, and my onions are starting to look a little translucent. So, I'm going to add my butternut squash into here. So, I'm just gonna give everything a little quick stir. So uh, everything's almost even in here with the little butternut squash and the onion mixture. Just toss it around a little bit. Not doesn't have to be perfect. So once I uh, stir this up a little bit, I'm gonna add three cups of water, just enough to submerge the squash in the mixture. So here's one. looks about good. And on top of the water, I'm also going to add 13 and a half ounce of coconut milk and it's unsweetened. So it's unsweetened coconut milk. I'm gonna add that on top of the water as well into this pot here. Okay. So we're gonna let this mixture uh, sit in here until it boils and once it boils I'll turn the temperature down to a medium temperature or maybe a lower temperature to where it's like almost simmering and then I'll, I'll go ahead and let that simmer for about I don't know 12 to 14 minutes. So while we're waiting for this uh, squash and onion mixture to boil up we're also going to go ahead and toast some coconut flakes. Okay, um, they're unsweetened coconut flakes. And before I put them in the oven, just so you know, the oven has been preheating. It's already reached its 300 degree temperature. So I'm just gonna spray this pan really quickly. Just not too much, but just a little bit. And then I'm just gonna toss these flakes in here so I can get them toasted. Fun stuff. All right, move it around a little bit so it can be cooked somewhat evenly while it's in there. And this is probably only gonna take about five minutes. We, we just need it to be browned and toasted. Okay, so it's been about five minutes or so and the coconut flakes are toasty and golden brown and delicious. So I'm gonna take them out. Wow, it's pretty toasted. Yep, 
So when you take them out, they're supposed to be toasty like this. You can see how they're kind of like golden brown. That's when you know they're ready. Also, this um, pot is now boiling. So I'm just gonna turn the temperature down just a little bit so it can simmer, okay? And we're gonna let this simmer for about 12 to 14 minutes. Okay, so this has been boiling for about 12 to 14 minutes now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move it over to the blender. We're gonna blend everything we just cooked in here so we can make our soup. So I'm gonna set this to the side. Be careful not to burn yourselves. We're gonna move this over here. Alrighty, gosh, that smells delicious. All right, so when you put this in the blender, make sure to put like one part of the, you know, ingredients and one part of the broth. You don't want to overfill. So we're gonna move this over like so. So you see, I don't know if you can see, but I feel like I have too much um, ingredients. So I'm gonna put some more broth in there so it can kind of even up. There we go, that looks about right. All right, so we're gonna do this in small parts. So I'm gonna do this part and then I'm just gonna repeat the process. I'm gonna uh, blend this and put it into this large bowl and I'm just going to repeat the process until this pot is empty and um, we'll do that. And when you blend, just start at the, the lower speed and then just work your, your way up to the higher speed until it's like a silky smooth blend. So this is my first little blend here. It, it really doesn't take that long, but this is what it should look like. You know, it's supposed to be a soup. So that looks like a soup consistency to me. <laughs> All right, and then we're just gonna, like I said, we're just gonna repeat the process, so. It smells good. All right, that was the last batch of the soup there. It smells so delicious. I hope you guys try this at home. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I've already kind of cleaned out the pot that it cooked in. We're gonna pour it back into the pot because the soup can lose some temperature while it was in the blender. So I'm just gonna pour this back into the pot like so. And we're gonna put it back on the stove for just a few minutes until we can see the steam rising. Um, and once the steam's rising, then it's ready and hot and good to go. So we're gonna do that. Put it back on there. Now, um, while that's steaming up, I did um, cut some lime wedges, like so. So you can garnish if you like lime. I love lime. So if you like lime, you can garnish your soup with this lime. Okay, I'm also going to go ahead and juice a lime. So I bought two limes. I cut one lime in wedges, and the second lime, I'm going to juice it. Once it starts to steam, the once it starts to re-steam again, I'll add the um, I'll add this lime juice in there. Anything lime is delicious and perfect. You can see how not strong I am. I'm struggling here. Here goes the second half of the wedge. I'm laughing because I cannot. 
Okay. Ugh. All done. All right. So I do see, oh, I do see some steam coming from the soup. So I'm just going to add this lime juice in there and then stir it around a little bit. And then we're ready to put it in a bowl. Just like that, yum. Okay, I've got some coconut flakes over here. So I'm going to just take a little bit and just garnish it like that. We're also going to add a little bit of cilantro in there, like so. And I had set aside a little bit of the coconut milk Take a little bit of it. Thank you, Paja. This soup looks and smells delicious. You did an amazing job with all the prep work and making the soup. We really appreciate it. Well, thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. We really appreciate your attention and we apologize for the technical glitch that we had and hopefully we can eliminate those in the future and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, good night.